Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our last class. Um, good to see to see you. Uh, yeah, I was just looking at figuring out. Uh, I think there are very few people today. Anyway, all right. So welcome to our last class of uh, Christian counseling. Um, uh, welcome to our uh, uh, e-learning students as well. This is uh, the last uh, class for for this course. Um, just before we uh, start off, a quick reminder for all the students, both the online students as well as the e-learning students, to complete your assessments by uh, by the end of this week. Um, for the e-learning students, your uh, certificates will be available on 2nd May uh, after you've completed all the requirements of the course. Mm -hmm. And uh, for us online students, for your uh, completion of the course, you would require to complete the both the assessments um, uh, and uh, yeah, th that's your requirement to be to be able to complete the assessments. OK. Um, so we'll move, we'll dive right in because I think we have quite a bit of things to cover. Uh, and uh, yeah, hopefully people will will start coming in. Um, so we're going to be, um, till last week, we did look at different kinds of uh, issues and particular concerns that comes up within counseling. And we dealt with all of that, a couple of uh, uh, different aspects or different situations that um, people generally face and how does one minister through counseling in those areas. <clears throat> Today, our last uh, session is on uh, ethical considerations, the ethics and boundaries that uh, we need to cover, uh, especially and be, be aware of while in, in counseling. Um, like any excuse me like any profession any uh, profession that uh, that that is around that uh, people are involved in there is the um, there is a certain code <clears throat> or a certain certain principles that uh, that keeps the workers of that profession binding to binding to it so certain principles or certain rules that um, or a common set of values or certain standards or beliefs uh, that uh, that you have to be binding to in order to uh, move ahead with your profession. So similarly, even in the case of counseling, when you're looking at both secular as well as uh, Christian counseling, there is a certain code of ethics that we need to follow. And... Um, this material has been taken or it is drawn from the uh, the uh, AACC Code of Ethics, which is the American Associations of Christian Counselors, their Code of Ethics, and it has been drawn from there. So um, there is a backing. So it it is a uh, you know that it it it's actually also documented in um, the one of the journals called the British, British Association for Counseling and Psychotherapy. So these are the code of ethics that uh, we we would like to incorporate. So we've drawn it from, from these sources. And it is um, necessary that uh, um, we understand these ethics, these standards. However, you know, you will come to see what which of these ethics are really binding for someone who is in a pastoral counseling role as well. And we'll uh, quickly, we'll look at that um, at the end, but it's it's important for us to um, know that. Okay, so just give me a minute and I will quickly put up my slideshow. Okay, all right. So um, let's let's look at uh, a couple of 
uh, maybe certain um, certain definitions uh, as we as we go forward. So when we look at the word ethics, or when we're looking at professional ethics, they are certain principles or certain standards that govern the conduct of the person. When you look at the word ethics in itself, it's standards that govern the conduct of a person who is operating within a specific profession. And uh, these are principles that actually specify what is uh, good for the profession, what is not um, right or acceptable for the profession. It is also gives a good clarification. Uh, why are ethics needed is because it gives a clarification of what should be done, what should be done, should not be done, or what is right and what is wrong, or how do how are some of these standards and principles applied even in a profession. So just like we we see it in every profession, we also see it in the profession in in counseling also because counseling at large is is a skilled profession. It's something that you build skills and techniques. And uh, so there are certain things that, that, that keep you binding in, that, uh, in, in the framework of, uh, of, of the profession. So let's look at uh, why, do we, why do we need to have these, these code of ethics? <clears throat> so there is a lot of <clears throat> evidence of um, you know, unprofessional or incompetent practices, even that rises among uh, Christian counselors. Uh, and there can also be um, uh, increasing complaints of a counselee and a counselor's, uh, uh, the dynamics that happen with it. So this code, uh, why is there a code necessary? Because it really outlines a certain foundation of preferred values and um, agreeable behavior, uh, professional behavior, upon which the counselors can really shape uh, how they do their work uh, and also their identity as a counselor. So it defines principles where practice, um, where, where a diversity of practice is acknowledged and encouraged, and also it includes certain limits beyond which um, uh, you know, which practice deviance is not really permitted or not really tolerated. So this, uh, the code of ethics, it gives you a certain ethical framework. You know, it, it's like a, uh, it, it, it gives you a boundary by which you work so that you assure that the people you're caring for has been taken care of in absolute dignity and care and they receive the best kind of services. So the code of ethics um, is a common set of beliefs and values. They're a set of standards of care and behavior. It also offers a sense of reassurance to those who may be using the service that uh, there is a certain thing that is binding. They, uh, people who are using the service understand the boundaries of it. That is, uh, it also reflects that counseling is the profession and it's something that is seriously taken. So in, in, that's a place where <clears throat> you build on certain skills, you build on certain techniques, you understand what the word of God says. So it is also, we're looking at it as, it's, it's a serious business. It's not something that you, you take lightly. It also, when there is a code of ethics, it also raises the quality of service because you are, like we said, binding on some of those principles. And it is also a place where there are complaint, there are complaint procedures that can go back. So if someone is, uh, you know, is unhappy or something has gone wrong, there is some, there is a place that you can actually bring back <clears throat> your concerns and um, uh, redress in like a grievance where you can address some of those situations and those issues. Okay. Um, so what is the mission? Of the of the code uh, in itself is um, so. As a Christian counselor, what are we called to do? We call to um, really uphold the the God given worth and the dignity of a person of every human being or every person that uh, that we come in contact 
our contact with. So we, we know that we are God's creation. And because we are God's creation, we are due all rights and respect and um, ordered logic that that the fact that, that that the that the very fact that you know you are a creation of God. So as Christian counselors, we are to express that appropriate care towards any counselee um, or or anyone who is inquiring of a service or or anyone who is encountered to us in the course of of ministry or in the course of practice, without any regard or discrimination to race, to ethnicity, to gender, to socioeconomic status, to age, to marital status, to education, occupation, denomination, belief system, values, or any other political affiliation. Because we know that God's love is unconditional. And uh, so at this level of concern, uh, it's, it's at that level of concern that we function as a Christian counselor. So the mission of the code is to provide that ethical framework from which we assure that every person who comes to us is taken care of with absolute dignity and care, and also they receive um, the best kind of service that is, uh, that is uh, possible, okay, and that is due unto them. So just a couple of scriptures that gives us, um, you know, uh, an admonition about as a Christian counselor, where, where does the base of these codes come from is uh, specifically when we look back at the word where we are asked to bear one another's burdens. We are asked to have, um, you know, to look for opportunities where we are able to bless and do good to uh, to all people, especially to those in the household faith. So it is something that is given to all, but especially to those who are part of us. And whatever we are doing, we're doing so for the interests of others as we take on the attitude that that is there in Christ Jesus. So these are specifically three scriptures that I just want to highlight that helps us to stay grounded at what uh, our responsibilities uh, are like, okay? Uh, are you all able to hear me? Is everyone on the call? Because I've not heard any voice up until now. So I'm just checking. Yes, ma'am, we can hear you clearly. <laughs> Thank you, Avni. <laughs> all right, okay. So, um, so what we're going to be looking at is we're going to be looking at the principles. What are the, what are the important uh, uh, we're going to be looking at seven core principles, and we look that as a code of ethics too, as we as we discuss each of them. So we have. Um, I'm just going to quickly read them out. So the first one is compassion, uh, the principle of compassion. The second is a principle of competence, which means how we excel in what we are doing. Then there's a principle of consent. Um, where we are called to be honest and integral to what uh, we have promised. Uh, confidentiality, that is a place where you're called to be trustworthy. Um, a place of dignity where you regard others, uh, um, regard others based, not based, I mean, you give them unconditional regard and it is not based on any kind of a cultural difference. It is a call to relationship. That is the way that you relate to other people in the profession. And lastly, it's uh, how you can be present within the community to offer these services. Now, I'd, I'd like to I'll go into each of this um, a little more in detail uh, as we as we move forward. So, like like we we just said, this it it all of this outlines that foundation of values and, uh, a, and a behavior that really upholds what Christ has taught us. And as a counselor, we shape into that identity and whatever we do comes as a result of what is in scripture. Okay, so we're working for the good of the individual or the society by doing, by actually promoting their emotional health, promoting their mental health as well as their well-being. And also 
we honor commitments, we keep promises, we fulfill our responsibilities of trust in the professional relationship. We deal truthfully with, with people with whom we come into contact with. Okay, so let's uh, let's look at each one of this uh, a little bit more in detail, so uh, we have a, a understanding of this. So, when we look at Christian counseling, the the service of Christian counseling, the basic hallmark of Christian counseling is compassion and service. So, as a counselor, we should proactively avoid every manner of harm or exploitation or discrimination in every matter that relates to the counseling. And what we are helping to do is to ensure safety and well-being of um, the counselees. So the Christian counselor uh, is to be aware of um, their own psychosocial as well as spiritual influence and uh, in, in your uh, in the in the helping relationship the christian counselor needs to be aware of the dynamics you know sometimes um, uh, there is a you know especially when there is a you know in relationships that you see where, where, where there is a person who's who someone goes to that that sometimes can be a one one upmanship and the power dynamics that can play there can harm uh, uh, even count counselees. So if, if a counsellor is on, is on an up, uh, one upmanship role, it can bring about significant harm to the, to the others, even when there probably isn't a harmful intent. So just to ensure that you're careful of that and being absolutely compassionate and um, uh, having the mind of service, just like the way Christ offered himself for, for his people, for mankind, the way that he offered himself without any kind of, um, in a place of being relatable as well. Okay. So what does this, uh, this really, uh, and now even as we are saying this, I think we need to know that as Christian counselors, um, we strictly avoid all behaviors or suggestions of practice that harms or even reasonably can harm counselees or their families or a social system. Okay. And uh, some of the examples are really brought about here. So as a counselor, we do not advocate, as a Christian counselor, we do not advocate or support or even assist any harmful actions of the counselees especially those that imperil human life. Um, and you agree the protection of human life, and that becomes the priority. The protection of human life becomes a top priority and a top value in a, in a professional or even a minister, ministerial intervention. And counselees who now, for example, and, and some of this that is uh, that we've brought up here is um, abortion, separation and divorce, premarital, extramarital sexual behavior, substance abuse and other addictive behavior, homosexual, bisexual, transgender behavior, euthanasia and assisted suicide. Now, if counselees who do or intend harm are not also to be abandoned, and should continue to be served in these troubles as far as it is humanly possible. But as a counselor, you make your stand that you do not support or assist any of this, but they are not going to be abandoned, even though they may choose uh, a lifestyle as as may have you know as, as any of this that's been highlighted over here. So keeping that in mind. Uh, that uh, despite showing the compassion and the service, there are certain boundaries that uh, keep to that. Okay, we'll go to the next one, which is competence, competence in Christian counseling. Now, in addition to being Christian uh, or a faith-based counselor, we must also uphold that 
um, commitment to excellence, to a sense of professional excellence. So competence actually makes for, um, uh, uh, you know, you're actually keeping the pace when you say when you're when you're being competent, you are uh, keeping the pace with whatever research has been done in the field. You're also aware of maybe limitations that comes by. Uh, you also avoid any kind of exaggerated claims. And you're incorporating that very accountability when you are dealing with others. There you are also aware of your own personal issues and uh, uh, or personal, uh, not, not issues, personal um, limitations, okay, maybe something that you can't handle, and you make those needed and appropriate refer reference. So it is important to honor this call of being competent. And um, as a Christian counselor, you make do all that you can to maintain the highest standards of that competence with integrity, uh, knowing and respecting these boundaries of competence, both personally and with others. Um, so you so you are ensuring that uh, you're, you're not you're dedicated to this need to be excellent in in how you handle and how you work through things, but also keeping a, um, a mind and an understanding on knowing of how you respect those boundaries of competence as well. OK. Uh, now, as we're looking, as we continue to look, there is another aspect of uh, this call to excellence, OK, is that um, in, in our practice, it's often important to maybe consult or refer to other competent colleagues or supervisors or other resources when your own limit of counseling competence or effectiveness um, you know, has, has reached a certain uh, you know, stop. And uh, maybe some, and, and I'd like to probably just bring about some um, uh, examples as to when that happens. When is it that you may need to consult somebody or refer to someone who, who may have a uh, or refer someone who has other resources or, or more competent. So one is when, when you're facing issues that uh, you have not dealt with before, not experienced in handling. So you, you may not have, you know, especially you know, certain areas of lifestyle that you don't have a clear understanding to. That when, when that happens, you, know, you, you refer out when you don't have an expertise in that area or when counselees need further help outside the scope of your training, of your practice and your expertise. That's another point of time that you know, you know that the person needs help and you wouldn't want to violate and give them a half-baked job, but really help them get the best possible um, intervention as possible. Or when either counsellor or counsellees are feeling stuck in the process of counseling and are confused about what goals to pursue and maybe neither neither party knows how to move forward so that's again um, you know a, a time that you can do a referral outside or when counselees are deteriorating or making no real gain um, even after a number of sessions then it may be important to ensure that they are handed over to somebody else when counselees present an actual or imminent danger to harm themselves. For example, maybe they have severe depression or their suicidal intent, or they may be running away or there's excessive substance abuse or there's uh, a severe eating disorder. Any of that, when you do see that there is, uh, you know, there's some danger towards their health or to their life is when you would need to take or consult or refer to others. When, um, when counselees, um, um, when, when they pose a danger to even others, when there is a when there is a danger even to others, maybe there is aggression, there's violence, there's hostility, or there are threats. Um, when uh, or when uh, and and you notice that the counselee themselves see you're seeing a marked decline in their ability to care for themselves and function, 
then in, in even in their day-to-day -day, um, affairs, then is where you know you know that they may require uh, extra help, or when the counts counselees probable alcohol or substance abuse or dependence uh, requires detoxification. You know that they are in a state that you you cannot offer counselling. They probably need a medical treatment. Is when again you consult or you refer, or when the counselee's reality uh, testing is impaired to the extent that you know they don't have judgment they are not oriented uh, their emotions and their memory is very disordered like for example in schizophrenia or um, uh, in many episodes where there are the hearing voices they have very significant strong um, bizarre beliefs uh, and and you begin to understand that you know this is they're not in the, the space of reality or when there is a strong transference or counter transference now if you remember the word uh, i think we had spoken about it in earlier is when um, the counselee begins to uh, transfer their emotions towards the counselor looking at them as somebody you know they 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 are reminded of of somebody they know or counter transference is when it happens from the counselor to the counselee that that there is a lot of um, a uh, uh, push of emotions, push of thoughts that's coming from a more personal uh, agenda rather than something that is that is professional. Okay, or when there is a possibility of a dual relationship. Now I will talk about something like a dual relationship a little earlier. When that exists, a, a dual relationship is when you have two roles. Maybe one role is one of being a counselor, and the other role is maybe you're being a family family member. Or a or a counselor and um, you know or a colleague or a employer or employee, that is is what these dual relationships are, which we will look in a little bit more in detail later. Or when the counselee themselves ask for a referral to another counselor, is when you know you would ensure that you give this kind of a support. So as Christian counselors, um, what we also need to be careful of is. Um, the Christian counselors, we do not counsel or advise against professional counseling or medical or psychiatric treatment or use of medicines or legal counsel or any other form of professional practice. Okay, we do not do that. That's that's the call. That's the ethics that we hold on to. Why? Um, because uh, you know sometimes people do that because they believe that it is wrong to go to a to anyone other than a Christian. Uh, someone who has a Christian experience, okay, or because the provider themselves, maybe a psychiatrist or a or a hospital, is not oriented towards um, Christianity, uh, we we hold that ethics or that value that we do not counsel them against such a situation, okay. The next one is uh, what we what we call as the consent in for the consent in Christian counseling or or the call to integrity. Now, the fundamental right of a counselee is self determination. If you remember, we touched upon this when we were looking at the principles of counseling. It's uh, counselee self determination. That is, they should be. Uh, they have the right to operate um, on the, on their own. They they can make informed and informed and voluntary decisions to engage in whatever process that they would like. So that is the right of a counselee, and the self determination becomes a pillar for counsellors and for counsellees. So when you're giving the consent, when you're saying consent, it allows for the counsellor to operate in a transparent fashion and with honesty and giving the opportunity for the counselee to make any uh, voluntary decision uh, that will help them in their uh, their counselling process okay um so as a christian counselor what you're also doing is you're respecting uh, that there is a need for informed consent regarding what all do we need this consent for regarding for the structure and the process of counseling so often you know before we begin counseling we do actually help with some kind of a structure of saying what are we going to do 
um, what what are what are some of our foundational beliefs that we have? Like in a, in a, we have something called as a consent form where we do talk about the principles we use. Um, uh, what are the what are the skills? Uh, where, where do we get our skills skills from? What are some of the expected outcomes or results that you can see as we go ahead in these? Um, in these counseling relationships. So at the onset of counseling, counselors and counselees, it, it's important to discuss and agree upon upon some things. And some of them is one, the course of the counseling, the nature and the course of the counseling, what can be expected of, um, uh, you know, the the goals of the of the counselee, the certain certain uh, uh, problems or risks um, or alternatives that can come due to counseling. Okay, or uh, the 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 status of the counselor. What are the credentials of the counselor, um, and uh, who all will the counselor be talking to, or will be disclosing information to? Whether it's a supervisor or a team of counselees, uh, confidentiality and the limits of confidentiality, fees, and any kind of procedures that involve finance, um, or or time limitations about time and how they can access the counselor. Uh, during emergency situations, or you know, even certain procedures that one may have, especially when there are some kind of disputes or um, uh, misunderstanding. Okay, uh, so and even as you're doing this uh, as a Christian counselor, you do not presume that uh, you know all counselees want or will be receptive to explicit spiritual Christian interventions in counseling. You know, there, there can be, we, we cannot presume that, okay, if they know that you are a Christian counselor, th that uh, you will, uh, th that they will completely agree to, to maybe receive everything um, that may be spiritual or an intervention that's Christian. And that's why you obtain consent that honors the choice of the counselee so that they can be receptive to the practice, practice of uh, Christian counseling and the manner in which some of this are introduced. Now, this includes, what does this consent include? That is prayer. Uh, so, you know, to actually take consent and that's something we do uh, in, in, in our form, we write, if you do consent, we would like to pray with you at the end of the session. Okay, or Bible reading and references or any kind of, um, you know, biblical music or worship or meditation or um, any kind of spiritual discipline, formation, or maybe incorporating fasting plan as a spiritual discipline, or any other common spiritual uh, practices. So that's that's important to keep in mind as, as we are looking at uh, consent. And, and that is important for us showing ourselves as being integral, uh, showing ourselves to be honest in the way that we approach uh, counseling. OK, also, there needs to be consent given, um, you know, from parent or legal guardians or counselee representatives, like especially if they're minors um, or that or even documentation um, is something that you also do. Where where is the notes kept? How um, how uh, safe is it? How who all has access to it? All of that is something that you take consent for. OK. Uh, moving ahead, we are at the fourth point. Just just a quick uh, review. Anyone has any questions, any doubts? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Thank you, Pastor. Um, so, Pastor, um, so while we're talking about this, I know it's, uh, um, I think just, I may already know the answer. So, in in India, so we have a lot of people who also um, go to, I mean, for lack of a better word, it's 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 almost like a witchcraft practice. But they're witch doctors. I'm sure mm. they're in Africa too. But and and they go to witch doctors also, um, you know, culturally, traditionally, because their fathers families visit especially in, in the Hindu culture you have a lot of that and uh, say someone's coming to you as a Christian counselor and and 
I don't know. I mean, if if you have any personal experience, where you might feel, you know, that there are, there are two opposite forces that's colliding, mm-hmm. because this person is going both, you know, maybe under the pressure of family, family heritage. They're going and doing all these pujas and whatnot for his condition, but at the same time, he's coming to you for help, mm-hmm. and and you know, you're, you're trying a few things, but you you pres- you sense a presence, so. Um, part of you would want to say like stop going to the witch doctor I mean just choose one but would that be an ethical breach Mm -hmm. yeah so the fact that so something now uh, take just not um, okay this is very valid take even maybe a person who is going to multiple counselors um that's something that uh, you know you you would uh, and and that's where this point comes in this fact of a call to a relationship a collegiality when it comes to things like that you know that they are probably seeking help in multiple areas and uh, that's something that you would reflect back to them and tell them that it is ethical to ethical for you as a counselor uh, to not be uh, to be able to um, hand over uh, a person if there is another counselor seeing to be able to give up rather to be able to give up seeing someone because it, uh, it there may be certain conflicts of interest for the for the counselee themselves so you make that declaration to them that if they are choosing to meet two three people at one time you actually call that out and uh, let them know that it, it is not a practice that it can it can be more harmful for them than it may be for you so that is with regard to maybe multiple counselors now with regard to something like you mentioned um i think over here is where you would talk about bring about like even if they are going to let's say witchcraft or you know witch doctors um getting them to articulate the pros and cons of such of of going to such a practice not 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 in a way that you you are um, uh, defaming because again we we're, we're looking at dignity right so what we're doing is probably maybe asking questions like okay you were there went to the witch doctor twice and you're here with me twice could you tell me how that helped you what is it that that you saw um, what makes you come over here at this point of time? What are you seeing as the difference? And then maybe letting them know that it may be counterproductive to do something that is opposing one to another. Okay, like for example, you go to a psychiatrist and um, uh, you know take medication, and then you come to the counselor, and the counselor says, "Don't take medication. It's being counterproductive. They are not. Uh, it doesn't help at all." So even in practices like this, where people are into maybe witchcraft or other forms of treatments, which are more um, uh, occultish, that's something that you can bring up in, in the conversation. However, uh, and, and through the conversation, you're hoping that they will come up with, uh, with an understanding of it. But it may not be ethical to say avoid or don't or that is not right. Uh, but you are helping them to see, to be able to divide rightly where what kind of practices they're choosing and what they see as an effect. So that's something that you can call out, but of course not telling them that it is you shouldn't be doing that. Giving information and helping them to assess it is is the way to go. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Yeah. Okay. All right, so we'll go to the next one, which is uh, collegiality in Christian counseling, or it is the it is a call to a uh, call to relationship. Now, Christian counselors um, recognize uh, we need to recognize the value and the benefit of forming and maintaining effective professional relationships with others uh, across multiple domains. We cannot work in isolation um, because we need to draw from uh, what others are also doing okay and you may there are often times that you may need the help of others so who who does this include 
Um, these include fellow mental health practitioners like psychiatrists, psychologists, um, occupational therapists, okay, or community ministry leaders, uh, supervisors, um, mentors, uh, any kind of educators, uh, counseling, any counseling related referral sources. So collegiality really means, you know, how can you cooperate and professionally respect one another? And, and that's what should be encouraged, that cooperation, that respect um, uh, is what is encouraged as because they are, they become as opportunities to work on common ground and on common purposes. So that's, that's, uh, that's important in that. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's just to just ensuring that that you you maintain good relationships as well as um, learn about their contribution towards someone who you're helping and how valuable their contribution is uh, to who you're helping. Okay, the next one is confidentiality in Christian counseling. Now, confidentiality it recognizes that every counselee has a um, fundamental and a moral right to privacy and to have a wide range of thoughts or opinions or beliefs um, that that would that they would like to keep protected from public knowledge okay and this uh, this uh, counseling relationship between a counselor and a counselee is enhanced whenever there is an environment that offers that appropriate level of confidentiality or privacy and safety. And this dynamic helps, it is that dynamic that helps to promote that strong and effective trust relationship. We've learned about that. We've spoken about the therapeutic alliance or so the therapeutic relationship that actually is so important in the counseling process. So as counselors, we we should not break confidentiality regarding the counselee's communications without really first taking their consent or even and even discussing the in that you intend to disclose that without a written consent from the counselee or even a representative of the uh, of the counselor themselves okay so they have a right to to this okay um now it's important to discuss uh, sorry Sorry, move to slide. Did I move to slide? No, okay. So it's important to discuss the limits of confidentiality, and that's that becomes a part of um, our uh, call to integrity as well, right? Um, where consent, where you are discussing a limit of confidentiality, where counselees should be informed about both the counselor's commitment to confidentiality and uh, the limits before engaging into a counseling, like like we had said, um, you know, the counselor needs to mention that they will keep um, information that the counselee has shared confidential um, uh, apart from certain conditions, and that is something that needs to be discussed. So, so you, uh, we need to be careful that you avoid, as a Christian counselor, avoid stating that confidentiality is guaranteed or is absolute, OK? Uh, you've got to be careful not to do that, not to be bought into that. But there are limits of this confidentiality. And it, it has, the rule is, the rule of mandatory disclosure is protecting persons from deadly harm. And we, as Christian counselor, even accept the limits of confidentiality when there is a human life that is abused or is in peril. And as a counselor, you take that appropriate action and also including um, a disclosure of that confidential uh, information so that you can protect life, um, especially when there is threats like suicide or homicide or uh, body harm or life-threatening disease or abuse of children, elders or dependent people. So these are some of the places where you do actually completely ensure that that point of a uh, responsibility is there. Uh, yes, Shay, do you have a question? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Um, very recent case. Oh, I'm 
a lady who was uh, constantly being abused by her husband and um, she met a counselor who pleaded to make the case known so that she mm -hmm. could be protected and free you mm -hmm. know but due to the fact that she had begged the counselor not to mention to anyone what she was going through and that mm -hmm. she was waiting on God to allow her husband change mm -hmm. that never happened mm -hmm. until recently she passed on you know due to the abuse I think I'm just drawing up this story to ask a question that when do we now draw the line as counselors knowing that okay yes the information my counselee is sharing to me is confidential mm -hmm. and it's only on the basis that she or he gives me um the right, you know, to make this known to the relevant authorities, as in mm -hmm. the case of being abused, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that I can do such, you know, when do we draw that line to ensure that um, we knowing that this could be the end of that person's life, if that person mm -hmm. remains in that relationship or whatever the situation that may be detrimental to the life and health of that mm -hmm. cancer, where do we draw that line, you know, to break that, um, to bring or to go against their wishes not to yeah. make um their the information yeah mm -hmm. okay so um i think before i answer that question one thing that you would do in a consent form is very important that um or a consent or a, something called as a face sheet or an information sheet where there is um the name and details contact number of someone that you as a counselee can reach out in emergency and that emergency would mean anything that uh, is assessed by the counselee as physical harm and up to physical uh, uh, emotional danger okay so that's something that 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 is important to take so that's one where do we draw the line is through the assessment you begin to see that the abuse has been now maybe even when the counselee comes to you it's been after many years so how long standing has it been what have been the measures of help that the counselee has earlier taken how imminently uh, in what danger, what imminent danger does the counselee appear to be as they're, as they're discussing with you? And certain evidences of that danger, maybe there has been multiple um, uh, bruise marks, wounds, uh, you know, uh, cuts, breakage of bones, uh, multiple um, hospital visits. Now, all of that gives an added uh evidence to your case but let's say there's someone coming to you on the first hand and you have noticed uh um you know definite battering or badgering that has actually taken place you need to immediately let your counselee know that they require help giving them options of whichever areas they want to take and either it's a closer family member or some other um, a resource, uh, some other uh, uh, network, a close relationship network, employer, employee, extended family, or a legal system, okay, to helping them know that it is important to take on these three areas. Um, now, if, if for some case, okay, that it doesn't happen, also assuring, uh, letting them know that going back to that place of um, abuse is definitely unsafe for them so so what you're doing is you are trying to get them to commit to disclosing this with someone else apart from you as a counselor that's the very uh, gain of it and you would do that in the first time that you've made that kind of an assessment it's important to ensure that now at a time that let's say in your case like the like the one that you were talking about the counselee has refused then it becomes important for you as a counselor again uh, by informing the counselee that you may need 
to reach out to either a family or a, or a, you know somebody there or a legal authority in order because you see the harm, the risk that is there over their lives and that you would need to address this if not uh, personally with a family member then legally so you you need to do that especially when it comes anywhere with regard to physical abuse um sexual abuse it is important for you as a counselor to step out of that boundary and those are the limits of your confidentiality that's what we're saying you know and that's what's important to do right at the beginning giving the letting them know that these are certain limits of confidentiality and if there is an assessment of these kind of things you would need to reach out to somebody for help just so that they are ensured safety so that is your limit to that confidentiality you can reach out because or else what would happen is um uh, you can, as a counselor, you're probably uh, liable to get into trouble because you knew information that uh, that posed a risk to their lives, and uh, you know there was nothing done to seek protection over them. So it is important to do that and letting them know that those are the limits of your of the confidentiality. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Yes. Okay, thank you, Shay. All right, we'll uh, stop for a break. My my clock shows ten fifty three, and we'll be back at eleven fifty three.